it was a great honor to be invited to uh, give you a talk. It was a bit of a major challenge, as you may determine by looking at the picture, that's not the caribou you're seeing there, and I'm not talking about the person with the hat, that, that's me. Uh, also, uh, Chief Wilson, you're a very tough act to follow. I really enjoy your presentation, I hope people listen carefully, and I hope there's two things that you retain, well, I hope there's many things that you retain from Chief Wilson's uh, presentation. One is that you shouldn't shoot the big bulls. The big bulls are important. The other one is that we have a federal government that faced with evidence that the herd of caribou is down to one, is still wondering whether there really is a problem, which is not very good news. Uh, so I'm also used to make presentations where I give my own results. Most of the data I'll be showing you today that come from somebody else. And I'm also used to present conclusions. Uh, today I'll mostly be presenting questions. Because I thought that given that I'm fair, I've been working on angulates with, uh, for a little over 30 years. But I'm fairly new to the caribou business, and it's uh, it's interesting. Chief Wilson pointed out some interesting social aspects of working with caribou. And I thought that what I would do today is concentrate mostly not so much on what we know, and we know a lot about caribou, particularly in the case of boreal and uh, woodland caribou, we know how to conserve them, how to protect them, we're just not doing it. And I thought I would concentrate on things that maybe are a little bit less clear, or that I thought the evidence was not as um, as strong. So that will give me an opportunity to sneak in a little bit of information on animals that I do know a little bit uh, about. And as you can determine by looking at this picture, uh, the shaman's not dead, by the way, he's only sleeping. Uh, I like to work with animals that have tags in their ears so I can recognize uh, individuals. What I'm going to try to do today is, uh, I think I'm talking to the, I'm preaching to the converted. Uh, but my first point is that we know what the problem is with woodland and mountain caribou, we're just not doing anything about it. And so I'm going to concentrate on what is the, what I consider as some of the weaker links, the weaker sort of scientific links in our story of why caribou are disappearing, why woodland caribou are disappearing, which are the role of moose and uh, the potentially much greater role of roads of access uh, on their excitation. And then I'm going to switch to the other kind of caribou, the migratory caribou uh, or the thunder caribou and talk about how complicated it is to manage a species where limiting factors of the population may switch uh, over time. And I'm going to end up by trying to convince you that in some cases getting shot may actually not be very good for you. So we know how to conserve woodland caribou or mountain caribou. Um, we know exactly how not to conserve them. Chief Wilson mentioned a few examples. And we're very good at that. Many Canadians up here either are concerned with these caribous and government generally sees them as an obstacle to prosperity. So I'm not going to bother you with an extensive research of what we know about boreal and mountain uh, caribou. Here are some what I think are very good data <coughs> uh, that I picked from Ontario and from British Columbia. Uh, on the top, work by Lee Bors and Jim Schaefer in, uh, in Ontario. That essentially shows what we know. You cut the forest. Uh, the caribou disappear. So, does one of these work as a pointer? Yes. The yeah, danger bottom, one? The bottom green one. Yeah, the bottom were, green one. The explosion. Oh, yeah. I, I want to touch the one that says danger. Um, okay, so uh, more recent cutovers, you still find the odd caribou within 10 kilometers. Older cutovers, there's no caribou within 10 kilometers. And as forestry moves up in Ontario, so that's the border, the north southern limit of caribou. Forestry moves in, caribou move out. Truly excellent data from British Columbia. Uh, this is Heiko Whitmer's work. The proportion of forest that is under 40 years and the survival of female caribou. If you know anything about ungulates, if you have female survival less than about 80%, you're losing that population. And this is exactly what's happening here. This is the strongest evidence I've been able to find that directly correlates forest and industrial activities with we're losing the caribou. You cannot maintain a population of caribou if 20% of your females are dying uh, every year. The really bad news here is look at how much uh, of the territory needs to be affected by this industrial activity to have survival that is down to 70 percent, uh, less than 20 percent of territory. They don't call this the woodland caribou for nothing. It needs um, woodland. So we know what's causing extirpation of woodland and mountain caribou. Um, it's forestry, it's mining, it's oil and gas. And in British Columbia, it's, also, it's very likely also um, skidoos. 
as was rightly mentioned just a moment ago. So caribou die generally because they get eaten by wolves. Um, they also can get eaten by cougars and in, uh, by bears. In some cases, it's probably a problem also with uh, uh, poacher and some subsistence harvest. Predation, we know, is the proximate cause. Caribou die because they get eaten by wolves. But there's always been wolves in the landscape. There's always been caribou, and they were apparently coexisting. The ultimate reason is habitat destruction. So Chief Wilson already mentioned coal mine. Here's a coal mine in Alberta. This is what much of Alberta looks like if you look at it uh, with uh, Google Earth. Um, the habitat is heavily manipulated by industrial uh, activities. Uh, this coal mine is right in the middle of a route of one of the very few remaining migratory uh, herd of caribou in uh, northwestern Alberta. It's obviously an obstacle. It's threatening to expand into a major habitat for a major population of mountain goats. Does anybody know why they call them mountain goats? They need mountains. Uh, coal mine takes away the mountain. Same for this clear cut. They don't call it woodland caribou for nothing. It's woodland. So here is a pictogram or a scheme that tries to present the current thinking of why woodland and mountain caribou are going extinct. And there is very good evidence for most of this story. Um, we manipulate the habitat. We create good habitat for other species of ungulates, uh, mostly moose, but also white deer and other cervids. Population of these ungulates increase. So the predators increase, mostly wolves, but also bears, in some cases cougars. And that's bad news for the caribou. So you end up with manipulated habitat, increased population of about 30 prey, more predators, no caribou. The causality between industrial activity and the extirpation of caribou is very well established. I showed you a couple of examples from BC and from Ontario. There's others from essentially every province and territory in Canada. There's just no question left. Uh, caribou are going extinct because of industrial activity. The proximate role of predation is also very well established. Most of this additional mortality is because uh, caribou get eaten by, uh, by wolves. What I think is the weakest link in the story is this one. That's why I saw that. Um, the increase in moose following industrial activity. It makes sense from a habitat viewpoint. Uh, clear cut, uh, logging, uh, regenerating forest, that's really good habitat for moose and uh, for white tailed deer. And British Columbia is maybe a little bit of a different case because it is historically known also from Aboriginal traditional knowledge that many areas of the province did not have moose that Aboriginal people remember or not. There have been moose and moose have come in. But that is not the case in many other parts of Canada where uh, caribou disappeared. Also with logging and with the road, that brings in moose, but also brings in moose hunters who do a fairly good job of keeping the moose population low. So when we did the review of conservation of caribou in Canada, this is really, of this whole series of connections, this is the one where I really felt a bit, well, less confident that the evidence was, uh, uh, that the evidence was there. And I noticed reading through some of the abstracts for this presentation that people are beginning to question the role of moose in bringing up the number of wolves and uh, causing a decline in, uh, in caribou. So I think this is one area that we need to know a little bit more about. I'm certainly not saying that this idea is wrong. I'm just saying that over this whole story, it's the one that seems to be the weaker, uh, the weaker link. Uh, there is more convincing data that are coming out of Alberta of a very strong role of the increase in population of white-tailed deer in that particular province and the link with the increase in population of wolves. There isn't such strong evidence for moose in much of the rest of Canada. <coughs> And part of the problem here may be just that we don't have adequate pre-disturbance data. It's very hard to deal to figure out what is changing when you don't know what was there um, to, uh, to start with. I also wonder whether a mistake that we've been making is to lump, uh, and I've been making it today, I've been talking about woodland and mountain caribou, uh, about lumping those two types of caribou. 
would now, let's call it border care, who appear to exist with what seems to be a strategy of being a very low density, so being a relatively poor resource that predators wouldn't want to go after, and so coexisting with very low population, uh, low density of wolves. And if you have an alternative prey that brings up your wolf population, then that strategy obviously doesn't work. But historical account, and especially Aboriginal traditional knowledge, talk about very large herds of caribou in the Western Mountains. Uh, we heard it again from uh, Chief Wilson that this was the case in uh, his First Nations territory before uh, this reservoir was built. So I think in the West, uh, in the mountains, we were not necessarily dealing with a low density population that was subsisting a low density party, maybe as a predator avoidance strategy. It's probably something, uh, something different. And again, Chief Wilson pointed out one of the potential problems that really have hit the caribou in the western mountains. We've interrupted some of the migration, um, some of the migration routes, and maybe there were problems with um, over harvest. It might well be that. We've been concentrating on, um, we cut the forest, regeneration comes up, moose number increase, we get more wolves, they eat the caribou. If that was the case, why do we see this really strong difference between the impact of forestry and of forest fires? Now there's a lot of differences between a forestry operation and forest fire, but a post-fire succession creates moose habitat. Now these are data that come from a truly excellent report that was prepared for the federal government um, to uh, sort of document what we need to know about critical habitat uh, for caribou. And uh, uh, it was interesting, uh, Chief Wilson, that you pointed out the importance of critical habitat because the rather shameful way in which our federal government essentially rejected out of hand this excellent report was by saying, uh, this is not good because there is no Aboriginal traditional knowledge included. Uh, and I think the Aboriginal traditional knowledge will just confirm what was in the report. Anyway, enough of a rant. This is the effect of uh, fires on uh, calf recruitment. So here you have uh, cows per 100 cows, which is not the best way to measure population dynamics, but it's one statistic that we have, and eventually if you don't have calves, your population will decline. Adult female survival is much more important. So there's a negative effect, but it's very weak. So here we have um, population with a lot of the range affected by fire, population with very little of the range affected by fire, very low, um, very low effect. Look what happens when you look at industrial activity. This is huge. Any population ecologist that can explain half of the variability in calf recruitment by one single variable, that is an amazing result to get. I don't know what else you need other than this to be convinced that industrial activity is bad for caribou. Um, as the percentage of the range that's affected by disturbance increases up to 80%, your calf recruitment drops from 40% to essentially zero. And if you put fire and, uh, and you know, if you're very statistically inclined, uh, you might say, well, that looks curvilinear. Yeah, it does look curvilinear. There's so many points here, but it's clearly a very strong negative effect. Let's put fire and uh, industrial activity together, and um, you get to up to over 60% of the variability being explained. What is different between fires and clear cuts or industrial operation? When something that was very obvious in many of the slides that Chief Wilson showed, roads. I think roads are a huge problem, and uh, we maybe not know enough about exactly why they're a huge problem, but access is something that we need to worry about. I think it's something that's really affecting not just the caribou, but many other species. So how do we conserve caribou? We shut down the access. Nobody got that that was a joke. In Canada, a road, a forestry road, becomes traditional access within about eight seconds. Those of you who work for the government know how difficult it is to shut down the access. And yet we know that that is one of the solutions. That is something that we need to do. We need to shut down roads. Again, I go back to the skidoos. We don't know enough about how much of the problem uh, they're causing. But clearly, a big difference between fires and uh, industrial activity is the access. That leads to kind of other different, uh, uh, different problems. And road closures wouldn't just help us with the caribou. We know, for example, I've written a report on conservation of grizzly bears in Alberta. Roads kill grizzly bears. 
there is a bit of spectacle mountain goats. In this case, it was unsuccessful, and the photographer survived as well. Um, so the picture that I see for woodland mountain caribou is rather depressing. We are losing uh, the species. And we need to pay more attention to the role of roads in addition to what's really happening with increasing in alternative, increasing alternative prey and um, other <coughs> human, uh, human access. OK, so that's the sad part for uh, woodland caribou. Uh, if you look very carefully, the grizzly bear is drooling. Let's move on to the other type of caribou, the migratory or barren ground, whatever you want to call it, uh, caribou, uh, the one that moves over huge distances in uh, the tundra. And most of these populations are currently declining. So here is a few uh, examples of uh, North American herds uh, that are currently uh, declining. We know a whole lot less about population dynamics in these migratory uh, caribou than we do about other species of, um, of ungulates. What we do know, both from science and from original traditional knowledge, is that it is normal for migratory caribou population to fluctuate over time. Uh, there's time when there's lots, there's times when there's very few. And I would like to address two questions. And again, don't forget I told you I believe you with more questions than, than, uh, than conclusions. One is why do they fluctuate? fluctuate? And uh, the other one is given that most of the known herds right across the world, not just in North America, are currently declining. And given that we know that these things go down and in the past they've come back up, is that a problem? You know, they're declining now, but are they going to come back? And the prevailing wisdom for migratory caribou is that what's driving these fluctuations is their habit of eating lichens. So the caribou eat lichens, the population increases, uh, lichen disappear, and lichens take a long time to regenerate. So caribou eat themselves out of house and home, they crash, and um, it takes many years for the lichen to regenerate. When the lichen regenerated, there is low density of caribou and they go back up. And as the lichen the food resource declines, the caribou are forced to migrate over a wider, over a longer, longer distance, which takes more of an energy budget. So if the adult female needs to use more of, a, more of an energy to walk around, she will have less to produce milk. So the calves will have higher mortality, and also the age of first reproduction of the females will increase, and that's why you get a decline in the population. I wonder whether we thought sufficiently about the impact of predation and hunting, especially during the decline and during the low density phase. Something that may be changing with, again, increased industrial activity and global warming changes in the climate that, may, that makes me less optimistic that these declines will be followed by uh, increases. Let's first talk a little bit about predation. Uh, there is good theory and very strong evidence that migratory ungulates reach very, very high densities because they escape predation. Uh, caribou are a little bit different from other migratory ungulates because, yes, they increase to very high density, but they also fluctuate. Other migratory ungulates, uh, wildebeest, historically prongorn antelope, saiga antelope in, uh, in Asia, reach much higher densities than other species or other populations, the same species, that don't migrate. And the idea here is that by migrating, the caribou get away from the wolves. Because at some point the wolves gonna stop at its at its uh, at its pups, and so the caribou move away. Uh, the wolves we face with high abundance of prey for part of the year, but part of the year the caribou are gone, and so the wolf population doesn't keep up with uh, the caribou uh, population. It is likely that as these population increase to uh, high density, that will probably still have some kind of an effect population of predators, not just wolves, but also uh, bears. There's a lot of evidence that's coming out from recent studies on woodland caribou showing that predation by bears can be very important in some population, and we should not discount that uh, for um, yeah. for caribou in the, uh, caribou in the tundra. What do we really know about wolves in the tundra? Well, now that we've been able to put radio collars and GPS collars on them, and this is a work from Marco Muziani, we have very similar data from uh, GPS collar walls in, uh, in Quebec, they move. 
they move a lot. They'll move over hundreds of kilometers. Uh, this assumption that they cannot follow the caribou may not be as um, valid as we might have thought. And there's no question in my mind that during the increase phase of caribou, escaping predation is a big part of why they're able to reach very, very high uh, numbers. What happens during the decline though? What happens during the low density phase? So here is um, uh, what the data here show is uh, distribution of caribou and wolves over two different years in summer and in winter. And you can see that the wolves are moving. And look at the scale. This is 400 kilometers. These wolves are moving over about the same range uh, as the caribou. And as I said, there's now data from Quebec showing pretty much the same thing. Uh, wolves can move over very, uh, a very long ways. And I think this is a really something that we need to get uh, better data on. This is a very promising avenue for, uh, for research. Now look at that. Uh, um, right, this was to remind me that I should also point out that we also don't know about the potential role of bear predation, particularly in the calving ground. Uh, something else that may or may not be important, I think is worth having a look at. Uh, 